Well, this is the um, uh, DSD lecture number 13, I believe, and this is for the 925, uh, the Friday, uh, the 25th of September. Okay, so, um, uh, so first let's take a quick look at the syllabus, which is, let's see, we'll just shrink me down. Um, so here we are. Um, so we had the test on uh, Monday, uh, or sorry, the test on Wednesday, and the average on that was 70. Um, and then uh, we're starting Unit 3. So now we've covered uh, the review of logic design, which is Unit 1, Unit 2, and now Unit 3. And um, so this is Introduction to program Programmable Logic Devices. And um, I'm going to move myself over just a little bit, I think. And so what are the pros and cons of FPGAs? Well, so uh, compared to, say, a uh, dedicated chip. So a couple, a number of things. First, uh, FPGAs are huge. They have lots and lots of uh, pre-existing hardware that you can program on them. So they're powerful. They're also very fast. Uh, they're field programmable. There's massive parallel uh, uh, options. You have, uh, there are many, many pins. This, this chip on our board has 325 pins. Now, there, a bunch of those pins are, are repeated power and grounds, uh, but there's still a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, ports available. I actually don't know how many. That's a good question. I, I'll, I'll look that up. Uh, you can actually uh, instantiate microprocessors on this chip, uh, more than one if you want, and then you can still use uh, the other logic on the chip to do a lot of parallel processing at very high speed, and then the microprocessor can execute uh, sequential instructions uh, just like you would for a standard microprocessor. Uh, there's just tremendous flexibility. Um, on the downside, these chips are pretty expensive chips. They aren't cheap because not only do, do they have to, to have all the logic for you to program, but they also have to have all the logic that allows you to do the programming. Uh, the interconnect matrices, all the, all the, all the uh, programmable bits that control all the various uh, 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 parts that are programmable. And, and uh, these programmable parts definitely uh, uh, consume a lot of power, consume a lot of uh, um, uh, space on the chip, and so it makes them expensive. Uh, they do take a, a fair amount of power. Uh, they run hot. Uh, they're, uh, the, uh, in, at least for the Xilinx chips, uh, the, you don't get to flash your code, uh, your bit file, into the chip. Uh, it has to be reloaded every time the chip is powered up. And so there's a little bit of time dedicated to that. Now, you, you can flash the, whole, the entire chip in, uh, I just think, a couple of seconds is all it really takes if you have it set up correctly. But that requires extra parts, extra components, uh, extra circuits, that you, and then you have to manage those. Uh, these are big packages. Uh, they, they are what are called ball grid arrays. And uh, although actually the, the chip we're using, which is a big chip, uh, it isn't very big actually. Uh, if you actually looked at it, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty small, maybe no more than an inch by an inch. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. And how it gets 325 uh, little solder balls on the bottom of it I, is beyond me. Uh, there are there are some tr problems and tricks and pitfalls you have to play with. Uh, one of those is that uh, getting getting a very tight timing down can be tricky uh, because you, you you don't have a lot of control and guarantees about how uh, signal paths are routed through big interconnect matrices. Uh, the integrated development environments take a while to to, to master. Uh, it's hard to know what chip to use until you've pretty well done the project. Uh, and then you see how much space it takes. And then I guess you could get a smaller chip if you had lots of room left. 
uh, <clears throat> you definitely have to learn hardware description languages and um, <coughs> the uh, there's no guarantee that the hardware you create will actually work uh, that may sound goofy but uh, unlike a microprocessor that's been rigorously tested uh, that's been carefully uh, fine-tuned to make sure that that every microprocessor you buy is going to function exactly according to its specifications. Th because you're creating brand new hardware, um, there's no guarantee that the hardware you're creating going to work. There may be timing problems. You may have race conditions in some of your uh, parallel paths. Uh, there's all sorts of little things that can creep in and cause your your hardware it can look good uh, in simulation, but it can fail uh, in reality. Uh, and and Part, and then part of that is you're never really exactly sure uh, just exactly how the how the synthesizer is putting this all together. So you know if you want total control, um, you, you you pretty much have to do an application specific integrated circuit. Uh, of course, that's not guaranteed to work either, uh, and that can be quite expensive to have to redo those. Um, so we're going to take a, a brief overview of programmable logic devices. We'll talk briefly about simple programmable logic devices, but I, I think these have really, uh, I, I don't think there are very many of these left. I, I, I just, I don't know, I just don't think they're used that much. Uh, because uh, all of our microprocessors, a lot of our microprocessors now, have programmable logic built into them. So the idea that you would need a, a, a separate uh, programmable logic chip to do some stuff before you put it to the microprocessor, there's there's a microprocessor that can handle that and so probably you don't really have to do that and uh, on the other hand uh, medium solutions with CPLDs certainly reasonable uh, because these are a lot cheaper and for a small project they could be very useful because they, they actually are quite capable uh, they just aren't the behemoths that FPGAs are and uh, so anyway so so these are the these are these are their simple, complex, and field programmable gate arrays. This is kind of the, the, the smorgasbord of programmable logic devices these days. And like I said, this simple, uh, they're kind of, uh, you know, pretty slowly dying. Uh, it's a dying breed, I think. Uh, partly because cheap CPLDs are available. Um, so, you know, you might not really need to spend the money uh, you might be able to get a much more capable chip for about the same. Um, okay, so for programmable logic devices, there are a whole lot of ways to uh, to implement uh, combinational circuits. Uh, you can have NAN NAN NOR NOR. You can have uh, you can have multiplexers, decoders, and ROMs or lookup tables. Now the Xilinx is kind of kind of tends towards lookup tables and multiplexers, but there are some that have uh, you know, big C's of NAND and NOR, NAND, NAND gates or big C's of NOR gates that you can hook together. Um, programmable logic devices uh, have, you know, kind of kind of pr provide you a smorgasbord of, of some of these options. And uh, and then there's, uh, so there's, it, in the case of Xilinx chips, we have lookup tables and multiplexers. And then we have all the mechanisms involved to program those things, uh, which means that there's a lot of programmable switches, and uh, those switches have to be controlled by uh, by uh, bits. In the case of the Xilinx chip, there there are memory cells that hold a one or a zero, and then that one or a zero is used to turn a, a switch on and off. And some of the switches need more than one bit. Uh, they're, they're six-way switches, for instance, uh, where you have, you know, vertical wires uh, and horizontal wires, and you can route through this switch in any a number of different ways. Uh, so there are quite a few programmable bits just for that one switch, and a lot of transistors to make the switch, and then more transistors for the memory of the bits that, that it will program it. So the whole thing is, it's a lot of stuff, and this chip has hundreds of thousands of those. So it's crazy. Uh, I for, I used to know off the top of my head how many programmable bits there were, but it's I think it's it's more than it's a couple megabits, maybe more. It's quite a bit. All right. Um, 
So here's some of the early history stuff. I, I don't know. You can look at this slide if you want. Uh, so the the world of programmable logic used to look like this. I you know I guess it still does sort of. But this this piece here, this simple programmable logic device, a lot of these have I think dried up. Uh, a lot of these are legacy type devices. I guess you can still get some of them, and and you could still use them. Most of these devices. Uh, well, not, not the read-only memories, but, uh, but the rest of them, the PALs, the, the PLAs, and the GALs, those, uh, I th I th those required special software to program them. They did not use hardware description language for the most part. They had uh, proprietary uh, programs and programmers uh, in order to, to get them set up. Um, some of them used a thing called personality matrix and things like that. So they... Uh, they were they were kind of specialized and I think uh, they've really given way to uh, this these devices here uh, FPGA CPLDs mass programmable gate arrays and uh, read-only memories and then uh, and then of course creating a brand new chip from scratch all those are pretty much done with hardware description languages now these are factory programmed these are field programmed and and really, mostly, I think we're using FPGAs and CPLDs. And over here, um, the uh, uh, the mass programmable gate array still is still an option. Um, and then here we have the ability to factory program ROMs, which makes them much cheaper than uh, ROMs that you can field program. But obviously, we have ro lots of ROMs you can field program as well. Okay. Um, so the FPGAs basically uh, showed up in, let me slide this over, showed up in the late 70s. Um, the programmable array logics were developing into these complex programmable logic devices where you would, basically a CPLD was a bunch of PALs that could be interconnected. And, uh, and then sort of in a separate push, uh, this this, there was a, essentially a, this gate array technology, uh, our field programmable gate array. Well, that was the FPGA. And, and these are uh, uh, a couple of the early ones by, by Signetics. Um, and it, the, uh, some of them were arrays of AND terms. Uh, some of them had included flip-flops. Um, and again, uh, it took a while before they really... Uh, Began to be uh, programmed by hardware description languages, but all these all these changes eventually uh, came to pass. Um, so most of these FPGAs use this grid of logic gates, uh, and once you have a, a a program for it and you field that into a uh, device, then a lot of times that program is uh, is just the same program forever. Or maybe there might be some field update that, that would occur maybe a, a, in a, a, you know, a few times a year or, or maybe a few every, every few years. Uh, but that would be done by the customer, not the manufacturer. And, and that's one of the, the initial programming and, and then updates all done by, uh, by basically the, the customer or the person using the chip to build a product. Um, so here's some. These are, this is old. Uh, so, um, trying to think. So, yeah, this has all changed. Uh, a lot of these companies have been bought. Intel has bought one. Uh, uh, Microchip bought another one. Um, they've all gotten sliced and diced. But still, Xilinx is, is one of the big, uh, big companies. Uh, okay. Um, so... Yeah. So a lot of these smaller programmable devices are pretty much used for address decoding. Um, they can they can save you power, so that's one maybe argument for them. Uh, and the timing can definitely be more precise because the interconnect rays are much smarter, much shorter, and uh, so the clock lines won't won't necessarily get routed in a circuitous route through an interconnect matrix. Uh, that could uh, add uh, some nanoseconds to its time. Um, so these simple devices, 
they would they would typically have uh, input lines and output lines, and you have your read-only memory here. So this is uh, this is an example of using a ROM, and uh, we did this in the last lab, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, but basically you can you can program in uh, uh, a bunch of different functions. Uh, one for, if you have a uh, if it's a four-bit ROM uh, that has say in this case eight rows four columns, you can have four output functions. So, um, and one of the things I do want you to, we'll go back here, one of the things I do want you to be able to do is to, uh, is to understand how you size a ROM. This is very straightforward. So, you have some number of address lines which means you typically then will have two to the n, let's see if you n address lines, you will have two to the n words, and the words are as wide as your number of outputs. So if you have four bits of output, then your words are four bits. If you have eight bits of outputs, your words are eight bits. If you have 16 bits, you have 16 bit words. And uh, if you have three address lines, then you, you have eight words. But a lot of times we'll have 11, 12, 13, we'll have uh, we'll have a good number of address lines, um, and th these ROMs can get pretty big, 16K, 32K, 64K, uh, and they can be 8 bits wide or even wider. Now, some ROMs um, uh, don't actually uh, put out their address lines directly. They, uh, they work through an I squared C, where you might send a couple of bytes in to put in the address, and then you would either uh, send another byte or bytes to be programmed into the ROM, or you would uh, read a byte or bytes, uh, and all this can be done over I squared C, and then some of them are also parallel, are, are also uh, uh, SPI uh, connected. So some of these big ROMs might not even have that many uh, pins. They they could actually have power ground and uh, um, SCL and SDA and be done with it uh, for you know four pins. Uh, but still have 32k of 8-bit words. Uh, so uh, they'll be a little slower if they're doing I2C. Uh, if you do SPI, you could have a, a couple more lines and, and speed them up. Um, so a ROM with N input and M outputs. So uh, if you have N input variables, then you're going to have 2 to the N rows, or 2 to the N words. And you have n address lines, 2 to the n rows or 2 to the n words by however many output lines. And if you have m output lines, then your words are going to be m bits wide. Okay. How do you specify the size of a ROM? So this is really important. Uh, if, if you're doing a project and you're told that you have to sto store so many things, then you definitely need to be able to, to figure out uh, how big your ROM has to be to do this. Um, so you, you need to know the number of words, and usually you're going to round it to a power of two. Uh, so how many address lines is that going to be? Uh, so, that, so that's going to be two to the n address lines. And then how many, how big is each, how many bits is each word going to be? Uh, which drives the number of output lines. And then pins are basically power, ground, chip enable, program, erase, power. Uh, those, are, those are some of the lines you'll typically have in addition to the address lines and the output lines. Okay, um, so let's, let's look at a 2764. Uh, it was a very uh, classic uh, ROM in the day. Uh, it, it was one that was UV erasable, electrically programmable. So, and we called this an EEPROM. Uh, and it was organized as 8K words by 8 bits. And this was, uh, this was frequently used uh, to, uh, as, the, as the initial code to get, uh, say, a motherboard with an with a Intel chip or an AMD chip on it up and running. And the first thing it does, it, it starts executing these instructions, which typically then is enough to uh, to get a disk drive 
to read in a boot track into uh, random access memory or dynamic dynamic RAM in the case of a desktop or laptop and then this dynamic RAM uh, would then be uh, control would be transferred to what was read in and then the program would execute from there and typically then that would then boot up the rest of the operating system and then the operating system is going to load in the applications and uh, and everything's up and running um, and sometimes you typically in the old days you'd have two of these so you could have 16-bit uh, words you could have 8k 16-bit words and that was about the minimum you could get by with and uh, and uh, get a computer booted up using a disk drive uh, and having this code basically get the disk drive uh, started up and read in uh, the initial boot tracks. Um, so how many pins do you think this one would have? So it's got 8k words so what is that? So we know that 1k is 10, 2k is 11, 4k is 12, and 8k is 13. So that's 13 address lines. And then 8 bits out, so that's 13 address lines and 8 data lines. Uh, so that's uh, 21. And then you have uh, power and ground, 22, 23. And then usually a, a chip select or two, so that's maybe 25. And then sometimes programming power. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, maybe another pin uh, to uh, uh, to put it in program mode, uh, so so you know so maybe 28 pins something like that. And here you go, 28 pins. And notice it would have a little window on the top where you could shine in ultraviolet light, and you can also look through this window with a microscope, and you can see the dye, and it's kind of cool, and you can see the patterns and everything. And the ultraviolet light would allow the electrons to sneak away uh, and, um, and, and turn all the bits inside the chip uh, that you can program into ones. And when you program, you turn them into zeros. And this is what it looked like. So you can see you have uh, 13 address lines, uh, A0, where is A0? A0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, 9, uh, uh, seven rather, eight, nine, uh, ten, eleven, twelve. So you have zero to twelve or thirteen address lines. Power VCC, programming power VPP. Uh, these required programming power of about maybe twenty-five or twenty-four volts, twenty-one volts, uh, and they went, ran at five volts. Uh, you have an enable. You have a uh, uh, I forget what the G was. That might have been a. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the enables and output enable. I don't know about the G. And then the uh, uh, the P pin uh, might very well have been an input pin to. Uh, and then you should have uh, eight bits of data out. Q zero one two uh, three four five six and seven, and then ground. So those are your pins. So you could also have a, uh, this ST2425X08, uh, so it's 8 kilobits of electrically erasable programmable memories, and they were in four blocks of 256 by 8 bits. So, uh, so, it, so in this case, uh, you could, I guess you, I guess you would have I guess it's one bit wide, 8K by one bit is what it is. Uh, and you could organize it in, in 250 blocks of 256 uh, eight bit words if you wanted to. So that would be 1K, no, uh, yeah, 1K of words. Um, 1K of eight bit words are 8K bits. And you have to make sure you pay attention when it says 8K bits, that's, you know, if it's an eight bit word, that's only 1k um, so but look at it look at how little this is four eight pins so how could that how could that device um, have uh, eight you know 8k addressable bits even if you addressed even 1k that's still 10 address line I mean uh, yeah still 10 address lines 
So how does that work? Well, um, this this one was uh, run on run, runs on I squared C. Okay, and then uh, here we have a ROM that's going to implement a two bit adder. Uh, so one bit of A, one bit of B, one bit of carry in, uh, and a, then an output uh, sum. Uh, actually, it, it, it generates three outputs, two bits of sum and a carry out if you want, or three bits of sum if you want. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, this is pretty fast uh, <clears throat> because there's no ripple uh, effect here. So if you have, a, I guess it's a two bit adder, so that's why you've got three bits out. Two bits of X and two bits of Y. So how many rows do you have to have? Well, you, you have to have, you've got four inputs, so you have to have two to the fourth or 16 rows. <sighs> and um, so your 16 rows, uh, how many bits is, is, your, is your word size? Well, it's at least three bits. And uh, and you have how many words? So you have 16 3-bit words. All right. So 16 word by 3-bit ROM for a 2-bit full adder. That's kind of cool. And that'll be a pretty fast adder. There will be no ripple. All you'll have is the propagation delay uh, till the ROM outputs its output. Which isn't trip. It, it was it. Which isn't uh, negligible. Um, ROMs are not su always super fast. I guess they can be, but anyway. Um, so here's a priority encoder, eight to three. So you have um, your you, you have uh, eight inputs, and uh, the uh, so. Uh, if you ha if D is active, then there's an invalid uh, input. So the way this works, it's kind of a little goofy. But uh, so Y7 um, is uh, the highest priority, and Y0 is the lowest priority. So if Y0 is one, and uh, let's see, no, I guess it's the other way around. Y0 is the high. Y0 is the highest priority. Uh, so if y, let's say uh, y4 is a 1, um, then it means all these other bits don't, are don't cares. Uh, it's a little confusing. No, I guess, OK, y7 is the highest priority. This is low order, high order. y7 is highest priority. So uh, if, if all the bits are 0, then you're, you get an output of 0, and you get d is 0, which is an invalid output. Um, then if any of the lines are one, uh, if well, several of them could be one, but if y if uh, y seven is one, then you output one one one, and d is one for a valid output. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, y four five six and seven are all zero, but y three is a one, then it doesn't matter about y zero one two. So you can see that it's prioritized and that and that. If this is a one, then everything else is a don't care. So only when everything else is zeros does this one assert itself and drive the, the output to zero with a, a D of valid. Otherwise, the output will be zero. Uh, if, if everything's zero, the output will be zero, and the, uh, the D bit will also be zero. So this is a priority encoder. And um, so how big does it does a ROM have to be to do this? What would it take to make this work? Well, how many inputs do you have? So you've got you've got seven inputs. Um, or eight, sorry, eight inputs. So so you're going to have to have. Uh, it looks like to me you're going to have to have uh, 256 rows, um, and then and and yeah yeah. And you have uh, outputs. You have four outputs. So, so you have to have four bit wor four bit words, and you have to have uh, 
256 rows. And I think, yeah. So, to the eight words, four bit ROM. Yeah. Okay. So, what are some types of ROMs? We've kind of been over this before, but just it's good to review it. So, the standard basic ROM is a read only memory. Generally, when you see this, what this tells you, unless it's being used as a generic term to apply to all the types of ROMs, it, this would be one of the original fuse based ROMs that, uh, that can only be uh, programmed at the factory. So you send a list of uh, what every word in that ROM is supposed to be, and the factory manufactures the ROM to be that. And these are certainly going to be cheaper, assuming that you're buying a whole lot of them, uh, because they're, they're permanently manufactured with the, with the, the code you write. Uh, and if you're making you know, 100,000 or 200,000 or 500,000 devices, this could be useful. A good example where this might be a, a useful thing to do is if you're making keyboards, uh, a keyboard decoder, say, uh, for your next laptop. Uh, and you might have slightly different keys than the last one, so that's fine. So you, you, use a, you do a new run, and, but these are one-time programmable at the factory when they're manufactured. Uh, so that's going to make them cheap, but there's, a, there's that initial non-recurring engineering fee to get the first one uh, you know, set up so that it can be manufactured that way. And then after that, uh, then if you buy enough of them, they're gonna get cheap. Uh, and you're gonna amortize that, that one-time cost. Uh, you can also get a one-time programmable, uh, field programmable ROM, where you can program it one time and then you can't really change the program. Now, the erasable programmable read-only memory, that was uh, like the 2764 that we just looked at here. Where was that? Yeah, no. There. With the little window where you could erase it with UV and you could put it in a programmer and program it and then once you're all done you cover up the window so that it doesn't get erased accidentally and you plug it into uh, whatever board that it's going to go in. And usually you have to program it uh, out of circuit. Then there's the uh, then there's the electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. That's the EEPROM, and uh, the electrically erasable then can be can can be uh, uh, programmed and uh, and reprogrammed in circuit. And and then we also have flash, which is a particular type of EEPROM. And flash has gone through several generations. The flash, the current generation of flash is quad state flash where every cell can have uh, values of 0, 1, 2, or 3, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so anyway, uh, and that does change some of, the, some of the rules for how we do the logic. Okay, um, and, and the flash, the, different, the main difference between EEPROM and flash is that flash is denser, cheaper, but when you erase it, you have to erase uh, more than one byte at a time. Usually, maybe eight bytes at a time. May, maybe you, maybe even bigger chunks than that. Um, so you can't just erase a single location like you can with an EEPROM. All right. So here's a Mealy sequential circuit with a ROM. And uh, how does this work? Well, so we have a present state, next states. We have one input X, and an output Z. Notice. Uh, because it's mealy, we're going to have two columns for the output, one where x equals 0 and one where x equals 1. And this is going to be the next x. So we're currently in a, one of these given states, and then we get the next input. And if it's 0, let's say we're in S3. If our next x is 0, then we go, we're going to go to S5 for our next state, and we're going to output a 0. And if our x is a 1, we're still going to go to S5, but we'll output a 1. And so so this is, uh, this is the way we would implement a, uh, sequential, a sequential circuit. Now, uh, first off, how many flip-flops are, are, well, how many flip-flops do you need to hold uh, seven states? Well, obviously you need at least three. You can do up to eight states with three, but uh, for nine states you'd need four. So, so you can get by with three flip-flops. And uh, what about... Uh, 
what about the size and the content? So, um, so uh, how many how many uh, how many rows will the ROM have to have? Well, it's got to, it's got to have uh, it's got to have uh, an input for the current state, and that's a three bit number, and then it has to have an input for X. So that's four inputs. So it's going to have to have 16 rows. Um, and how many outputs is it going to have to have? Well, it's going to have to have an output for Z. And it's going to have to have three outputs for the three flip-flop next eight D inputs. So four outputs and four address lines. And three flip-flops. Let's see. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, so in, in the melee state, remember that the outputs depend on your present state and then the next input. Uh, so, so you have your inputs coming into your combinational network, generating your output for Z, and the next states for your, for your three flip-flops. We we'll call this the state register. In this case, the state register is a three-bit register, and it's made up of three flip-flops. And uh, you always use D flip flops when you're working with a ROM. You wouldn't want to use JK because that would that would add quite a few more rows. Uh, that would add if you have three flip flops, that would add three more rows. Uh, sorry, three more inputs, which would uh, dramatically it would uh, double three times the number of uh, rows you'd have to have. So uh, that would that would. No, that's not quite right. Uh, it doubles it doubles the output columns. Uh, well, you, you have one for Z, and if you had three flip-flops, you'd have three if you're using Ds, but you'd have for a total of four. But if you were using JKs, you'd have to have four outputs for a total, uh, sorry, six outputs, two for each flip-flop. Three times two is six, plus one, you'd have seven outputs. So it adds quite a few outputs, but it doesn't increase the rows. The rows would still be eight. All right. So you can replace. You can put the ROM right in here. Here are your three flip flops. So you have to drive the D inputs, and we're calling these Q1, Q2, Q3. So you have to have a, a D1 input, a D2, and a D3 input, and then the outputs from the flip flops go back and drive the ROM with the new state and then the input X drives the ROM with the next X input and so that that selects a row that row is presented to the D inputs and then the clock edge is set to trigger right right then and latch in that new state which is then presented to the ROM uh, as the new state and then the next X value comes in and the process repeats itself so uh, so size of ROM and contents okay so so the, so we we're gonna we're gonna use the we're gonna use flip-flop state encoding for these states and create a transition table so um, so basically uh, you have to have uh, you have to have you have to have 16 rows because you've got uh, the input X and the three flip-flop current states so four four address lines so two to the fourth or 16 rows, and you have to have then an output for Z, and you have to have three outputs for your next state. And all these states are going to be coded with three bits. So here's our, here's our transition table where we've, uh, we have our three bits. Uh, well, we have uh, our, our three inputs, Q3, Q2, and Q1, and X. So these are the present states and the next X input. And then these are the desired next states. So for instance, for S0, our desired next state when x equals 0 is 1. So that's the first row, 0, 0, 1. And our output for z is 1. So there's the 1. For, uh, for x equals 1, same state. Uh, we're in state S0, but now the input's a 1. The next imp x input's a 1. And this happens before the next clock. So the new x comes in, and uh, then that we want to select for S2 so that's going to be 0 1 0 for the for the D inputs for the flip-flops for D3 D2 and D1 
and uh, the Z output is zero, so we have to have that. So you basically, uh, uh, so we have 16 rows. And um, four output bits. So 16 words with a, a four bit word and uh, four address lines. Okay, uh, here's a programmable ar ar array logic. Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this because uh, I think these things are pretty much faded out. But, uh, but you have an input AND array. Uh, so what this means is you've got a number of AND gates here that can be connected to some number of input lines. And, uh, and then the AND gates will put out these product terms. And then your OR gate array can be connected uh, to uh, OR together uh, several of these product, some number of these product terms. And uh, they're all constructed various ways. Uh, the, the PLA has a programmable input array and a programmable OR array. Uh, but the PAL uh, has a fixed OR array. It, and I don't know how important it is to remember that. And so here are your equations. So if you have these min terms for your various Fs, you can then solve them and simplify them. And then you know uh, what your AND, what your and uh, uh, gates need to look like. So you need to generate A prime B prime and A C prime, uh, B by itself, B C prime, A prime, uh, and then, uh, yeah. So, and you get to reuse these terms. So here B shows up here and here, so you can reuse that. A C prime shows up uh, twice. A C shows up once. And A prime B prime shows up twice. And B C looks like it just shows Sorry, up one time. Sorry, I didn't time. quite catch that. Could you please repeat it? Um, so anyway, I don't know what triggers Siri every now and then. She just spazzes out and does that. Uh, okay, so here you see the programmable, programmable part. Here's your AND array gets programmed. Here's your OR array gets programmed. And you're, and you're generating, so A prime, B prime, okay, so A prime here, B prime there, so this AND gate's generating A prime, B prime. This AND gate is taking in uh, A directly, and it's taking in C prime. So this is generating A, C prime. And uh, this is only connected to B. What The way they do that, they either pull up the other two lines, say, say each of these has three inputs or two inputs or whatever, then uh, in this case, you'd either connect both of them to B or you'd uh, pull one high. Uh, if it's not used, it would be set high. Uh, and if you have three inputs, then all of these would have a, the third input would be set high or you'd double connect one of the inputs to one of the other connections. In any event, you generated these terms and now you can use these OR gates and pick which two terms you need for, the, for whatever output. This one's going to output A prime B prime plus A C prime. This one's going to output uh, A C prime B, A C prime plus B. This is going to output B plus uh, A C, and so forth, until you've generated all these equations. That's ridiculous. Sorry, I, missed that. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. And then, so here's our table. Uh, product terms, inputs, outputs. And, you know, this sometimes this was how they set up the programmers. Uh, they called this the personality matrix or whatever. And you can see how they're re reusing some of these terms. How do you minimize these? Well, uh, you, you uh, so the first thing you would do is you try and s simplify these expressions. And um, so here we go. And F1, F2, F3, now these are simplified. And then you have eight different product terms. So you've got B, you've got uh, BD, B prime C, AB prime, uh, C, BC, A prime BD, AB prime C prime, and ABD. So, there are the eight different product terms. Now, C, strictly speaking, 
does not require an AND gate. Um, so tr you try to minimize the number of distinct product terms. Uh, so obviously that helps you. And uh, if you can if you can reuse terms, that's helpful. Trying to share these product terms uh, is very helpful. So here we go. Um, so we have uh, Carnot maps uh, for all of our functions. And uh, we put in the, the min terms, you know, for F1, 2, and 3. So we have 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 8, uh, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 15, and so forth. So we put, uh, we put those in, in the, these squares, and we simplify the K maps. And then you can look and see, oh, look, you have this and this, so you could, you could generate this term, this term, and you can add these two together to get this term, this group of four. And uh, you, can do the, you can do similar things down here. All right, so you minimize each function separately. Then you uh, minimize the distinct product terms. Um, and you can, uh, the eight distinct terms can reduce to five distinct terms by, uh, by sharing. And sometimes you may have, in this case, you have A prime BD plus ABD. Well, that, that's the same as BD, but because you have an A prime BD here and an ABD there, uh, you can reuse these and that'll save you a gate. You can just put both of these into this one instead of having to generate BD separately. Here BC gets used twice, uh, B prime C gets used uh, twice, and then you have to generate this uh, A, B prime C. Oh, it gets used twice too. So here it is, uh, the programming, generating all these product terms, and then combining them with these OR gates. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just think this is, uh, we're not doing much of this. And we're, this is being done in hardware description language with bigger chips for the most part. All right. Um, uh, some of these, the early uh, programmable logic devices and programmable array logic devices uh, were programmed at the factory. Um, but are, they were one time programmable in the field, but you couldn't reprogram them. And the way you would do that would by, be by blowing diodes. Um, okay, um, so, so we have these uh, erasable, reprogrammable, programmable logic devices. Uh, again, um, so uh, again, these are sort of becoming obsolete, but um, you could even in circuit program some of these things, uh, but you usually had to have a hardware programmable for the PLDs. Um, all right, so here's a programmable logic device. It's a 22 CEV10. I, I wonder if you could even get these anymore. Uh, 12 inputs, 10, uh, 10 in outs. Um, so some of these would go both ways. Here's your programmable matrix, uh, 44 by 132. Um, so you'd have 44 inputs and 132 outputs or something like that. And then you have these, these macro cells uh, that you can, uh, you can program. And um, there were you know, proprietary languages specifically set up for these things. Uh, PAL, PAL SM, uh, PAL SM, ABLE, PLD shell, uh, and whatnot. But again, uh, they weren't, they were, they were primitive compared to the hardware description language. And, and that's why, that's one of the things that's pushed these out of use is because nobody wants to learn, uh, wants to buy a part and have to learn a language just to program it. Uh, so it's much better to buy a part that can be programmed with the HDLs. Uh, with, say, Verilog. Um, 
Here's a CPLD. Now these are still used and these you can still buy these. Xilinx makes some. Um, this is an XC3064. And I, I should look up some prices and see, but I, I'm, I know some of these, some of these are, are, are not very expensive anymore. Uh, and so you have, you have these function blocks with each one with 16 macro cells. Um, and th these have quite a lot of functionality in them. They have uh, lookup tables and uh, programmable logic. Um, and then you have this big interconnect matrix. So look at all the lines, 36 lines going to each function block and then 16 lines coming out of your macro cells, 16 lines coming out of your IO uh, matrix, and then you have your external pins on the other side of this. So the external pins can be inputs or outputs. Uh, they can run at different voltages. All that's programmable in your IO matrix. And, uh, and then you can connect things in lots of different ways with your big interconnect uh, matrix here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is a simplified uh, function block and macro cell. So this is the simplified macro cell. This is the simplified output cell. Uh, so you have, uh, you can come in from the IO pin and go straight to the interconnect array, or you can uh, go out the IO pin using this, uh, this uh, tri-state buffer that you can turn on. And you can have, uh, yeah, I forget what the numbers in there are meaning. One, two, three. I guess those are the stages. Um, and then you have 36 inputs from the interconnect array. You can you generate 48 different uh, AND terms, uh, product terms, and then you can have 16 OR gates, and they can then be multiplexed through the flip-flop or not. And then uh, another multiplexer here, which allows you to... Uh, to uh, uh, bypass the flip-flop or, or use the flip-flop. Uh, and um, and so, so you've got 16 of these macro cells inside of every, uh, uh, every function block, and this is your function block. So you can do a lot of programming. Uh, you can set up a lot of stuff because you've got, um, you can see you've got uh, four of these, mac these function blocks, uh, which are can have up to 36 inputs from the interconnect array, 48 AND gates, 16 OR gates. That's a lot. And then uh, every one of your macro cells, and you have 16 of them, has a uh, flip-flop built into it and a couple of uh, muxes. And then your output cell is also programmable by direction and, and, and also some voltage levels and other stuff. Um, and you can also use, it, it also does the... Uh, the JTAG boundary scan is enabled through these uh, output cells and everything, which allows you to program your device and also allows you to, to test it. Okay. And there's the output cell. Oh, well, let me back up. I wanted to see. So, so these, are the, these are what are programmable, and then all this is programmable. And the interconnect matrix is also programmable. Okay. And here's some. Uh, the Cool Runner uh, by Xilinx, Altera, the Max 2, and the 3000, the 7000, the Lattice, the Mach, and the XPLD, the Cypress, uh, these things, and the Atmel uh, ATF um, 15 and 22V10 and other things. They have about 10,000 gates, roughly. Uh, that's about the, the largest uh, CPLDs, 10,000 gates. 10,000 gates! That's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of programmable logic. Uh, 10,000 gates. We would have, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we would have killed for that. Um, so nowadays, it, it looks like a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, a, a million gates or more in a big FPGA, maybe several million. Um, okay, so how would we use a CPLD to implement a Mealy machine? So again, remember the outputs depend on both the present state and the, and the next inputs. Um, so, so here's your inputs and your outputs or output. And then here's your, where you're going to save the state. Normally we'd have flip-flops for this. And of course your CPLD does have flip-flops, so you can, you can use them to store your, your, your uh, present state uh, encoding. 
um, you just need three for eight for an eight uh, for up to eight states and four for 16 states and so forth and you've got um, you've got uh, uh, four times 16 of these in a, in a standard CPLD with um, that we saw in the diagram and then here's your combinational network okay so um, so what do we do here well so we have our AND array here and our, the macro cells uh, and they're going to generate uh, they're going to ha have the flip-flops so we're going to have two flip-flops uh, and they're going to output the two flip-flops Q1 and Q2 they're going to generate the Z outs and then our inputs say we have two inputs X1 X2 they're going to come in here so four inputs four outputs and uh, and we're going to generate these four product terms that uh, uh, well a, maybe a bunch of product terms and four R gates that are oring our needed product terms together to implement Z1, Z2, Q1, or well D1 and D2. And then we'll have a clock that'll every time the clock ticks it latches in the next new state uh, and uh, the next inputs. Um, so our field programmable gate arrays uh, have an array of logic box uh, with uh, lots of programmable interconnections. They're much larger than CPLDs uh, they've been around since about 85 um, and all the Xilinx chips are use static RAM to program uh, uh, to, to hold the program um, you can actually uh, reconfigure in uh, on the fly your FPGA if you really wanted to by over by overriding a new bit bit file into your RAM while you're while you're running it uh, and you could turn it from one type of device into an entirely different type of device on the fly and back again. There is a little bit of time to program, uh, maybe a couple of seconds, but uh, with just that little bit of couple of seconds delay, you could have a brand new uh, instrument doing something else with the same hardware. Um, kind of crazy. You do have to provide uh, on your printed circuit board the capability uh, to program the RAM when you power it up. So you have to have something non-volatile on your circuit board that's going to hold uh, that's going to hold the, uh, the the actual bit file that needs to be programmed. And for that, we'll often use a we'll use a ROM or uh, a flash memory or several other things. Or sometimes we'll download it from uh, from a microprocessor device. So here's some here's some um, this is a little more updated. Um, uh, thing, so you can see here's the the Artrix Seven. This is the, this is uh, the uh, this is the uh, I forget how to say this. Uh, it's the family of chips that's on our board. We have an Artrix Seven on our board, uh, and they come in a whole bunch of different sizes. We have I think the one of the biggest Artrix Sevens, but there's also the Kintex, the Vertex, and some, and then there are lesser chips like the Spartan and the Vertex. Um, well, the Vertex is more, but anyway, there's a, it's a Vertex six. The sevens refer generally to the fact that uh, that the lookup tables are seven variable lookup tables. Uh, so, uh, and these chips mostly these logic cells have lookup tables and muxes and flip flops. That's pretty much what they have. They do have uh, some extra gates thrown in to uh, for carry ch for carry chains and uh, and and chains and OR chains uh, to uh, make complicated logic with multiple bits a whole lot easier to do. And they also have some other things built into them. Uh, they have special transceivers. They have uh, they have some uh, they have some block RAM set up that just uh, can store extra bits. This would be useful if you're going to uh, create a, a soft core for a microprocessor, and then you need some place to store the program memory for that. Then you can use your block RAM for that. Uh, uh, they have, uh, in this case, uh, uh, this PCI Express interface, uh, uh, an interface to double data rate three memory, uh, and uh, what else? They've got some mixed signal stuff like. Uh, a to D converters and stuff like that, 
and they also have uh, have uh, quite a few pins. You you can get an Arctic 7 with up to 500 pins. The Vertex has 1,200 pins. Uh, just amazing. The Vertex 7 and the Vertex 6. The Vertex 7 has 2 million logic cells. Um, it has 64 megabytes of block RAM. It's just a lot of stuff. Um, it has, it, there's some digital signal, uh, there's some uh, DSP slices, and then some regular slices. Um, and kind of here's how they're laid out. They're laid out a whole bunch of different ways, but usually the, uh, these various uh, various uh, processing elements are distributed all over, and then they have this big interconnect area in between these devices. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna let's see. We're close. Let's see how far more we have to do. Well, we've got a bunch more. So, so we'll finish this up then. Uh, we'll we'll take. Uh, we'll finish this up on uh, Monday.